proceed with the final talk of this session. It's Thomas Stieglitz from Imtech University of Freiburg. Uh, Thomas is by training electrical engineer. He made his uh, PhD and his habilitation at the U University of Saarland mm -hmm. in Saarbrücken. Oh, wherever that is. Wherever <laughs> that is, yeah. I, I wouldn't comment on that, but, uh, yeah, uh, but I you can. know it. <laughs> uh, and since 2004, he's full professor in, in Freiburg. He's heading a, a big group of making uh, neural implants, and it's my pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I know that I'm the last hurdle between uh, to, towards the lunch. Um, and it will be probably after all those exciting questions, um, how the brain works and, and how we can understand different things comes always to the point that an engineer pops up and asks those nasty questions or boring ones or shows new probes. So the long title in short is why and where do probes fail? I thought that could be probably good sharing with you have, having the applications and then looking into that and see is that obvious where they fail and what can we do and do you have probably certain desires where they shouldn't fail? So that, that should be the story of my talk and I want to go a little bit into reliability and stability from my point of view because I think it's dependent on the application. If I work in, in mice, probably longevity is something different to somebody making cochlear implants for newborns, right? So the time scales vary a lot and therefore I think it's good to to just set them in a certain context there. And I selected three applications, one from the PNS, one from the CNS, and since we are all crazy about optogenetics, I have some, some ideas about that I'd like to share with you. Um, as an engineer, um, trying or dreaming of devices that eventually end up in human beings, uh, the question always is, um, can I do the same device several times and do I know in advance how the quality of the device will look like when I get it out of the process? Um, that's what I'm working on, so we're really doing a lot of work with respect to quality management and, and predictability so, so that we increase the yield or at least say, well, we know our probes are lousy, but we can tell you at which level. <laughs> which is also important. If you know I always get a probe that works only for 80%, you know I have to live with 80%, but if I have the promise, it should work for 150% and it doesn't, it's, it's a kind of disappointing. And, and that is what it's all about. And when it comes to stability, I think we have different opinions what stability means. One would say, if I get a single neuron for four weeks, that's stable. Somebody else would say, um, I'm happy enough uh, if the connector does not break or something like that. And therefore, it's a really, I, I know this, this is a kind of uh, kindergarten uh, sketch, but I think it's important to see that we have two factors. One is the technology, where engineers can do a lot about that and try to do something. Um, and the other is the human factor and the biology. And we cannot, I've just recently reviewed a paper and people say, oh, a biosensor works perfectly well if I dilute PBS by a factor of 100. I think that is difficult with life if I dilute my, my body by a factor of 100. So that does not work in vivo. And therefore, we have to see what can we change. Can we have some education and some, some points where we say, well, uh, you have to push and not to pull or something like that. Does that work? And what are the other inherent factors where we have to invent new methods, uh, new approaches that things really work? Um, and since my group grew a lot over the last years, we were um, doing a lot of different things, different probes for the central and the peripheral nervous system and some probes for optogenetics and I'd like to guide you through different examples here in this, this talk, uh, what we have experienced in the different applications and that technology can behave differently depending how you connect technology to your recording equipment, um, how often you have to do that, if this is a non-human primate, a rat or a human being um, and in which environment that takes place. And I like to start with an example from the peripheral nervous system, one of my favorite ones where we tried to deliver sensory feedback 
after hand amputation together with Sylvester Michera's group and a lot of other persons there. And one thing we had to learn, and I know that some of you know those slides, so I try to shuffle them in a different way. Um, and one of the key factors using miniaturized systems is that they have to stick together. So a lot of stuff is all about, is about adhesion. So if you, if you try to imagine a cardiac pacemaker electrode, well, we have a long wire and a silicone hose and the tip is the stimulation electrode. This is probably 0.1 millimeter thick. And if you put that into a heart and it stimulates for 30 years, and we remain with half the th of the thickness because the rest has corroded over the lifetime, it's still fine. You know, we have 50% of the thickness and those 50% are probably 50 microns. If we talk about microsystems engineers, we start with 300 nanometers to one micron. There's not much to delaminate, right? And if it's very thin and you just blow over it, it might vanish. So that means all that stuff really has to stick and that's important to, to tell because sometimes we'll say, oh, we go into nano, that's even more sophisticated. That's right, but in nano it's even less that can vanish before function is gone. And therefore we have really high expectations and requirements on the material that it really sticks. And the picture on the lower left is um, an electrode, metal electrode, platinum, embedded into polyimide, so something that is nowadays kind of standard. And we look from the backside of the electrode. Since the polyimide is transparent, we can look how does the electrode, if I look on, on its back. Left hand side, that's a pristine one that looks really good. And the other one is a one that we stimulated about not that many times. So I think it was 60,000 pulses. That's nothing. Normally you have to calculate billions of pulses there. And just by seeing the salt water and incorporating a little bit of hydrogen and oxygen, the intrinsic stress changed. Um, and the metal said, oh I, oh, I remember I don't have a covalent bond to the underlying substrate, so what do I do? I have too much stress, I go away. And then it popped up. That's not much, but, but it popped up a little bit. And if you're so thin, 300 nanometer, and you experience a little bit of additional mechanical force, you just flake off, and then the electrode is gone. That's something you won't, you don't want to see, at least I don't want to see in a human being when we go to clinical trials. It should stay stable. If it's explanted and it does not work any longer, then we never know is this due to the material properties or does some person like the surgeon scratched over it with a pair of tweezers or something like this because that's hard to distinguish afterwards. But this was something we, we did not like to see in a human being and took us quite a while um, to, to steal some ideas of Stuart Cogan and modify them a little bit to get an adhesion promotion layer made by silicon carbide and diamond like carbon really having strong covalent bonds to the metal and the, the polymer. And to show you how this could look like, I brought an example here with me about that. Um, the first and man clinical trial was about 30 days and that is what the, the following movie is about. How does that look like if we deliver um, sensory feedback by stimulating the radial um, and the ulnar nerves in a way that, the, well, we tricked, we tested the patient in advance and this patient had to say, well, this is my index finger, uh, that's my little finger. Of course, he always said, oh, that hurts, and then we had to mark this electrode hurts, don't stimulate it again. Or he said, oh, that feels like, like moving, flexing, extending my hand. That was also not the right feedback. But we found um, the two or three channels that were good in that. Since you do not know in advance which channels these are, you have to start with a lot of channels. So, so having redundancy, um, because as surgeon, you, you know that better than, than I as an engineer, you, you cannot look at a nerve and say, oh, this is a sensory nerve of the little finger. You don't know that. We have 10,000s, and so we have to implant devices with many contacts and then really find out on an individual base how that worked. Um, of course, we had a yield smaller than 100%, right? So electrodes failed over time, and this is something I like to comment on later on. But first, I um, want to share that, that movie with you. Um, that was a European project, and we got another one, so it was a huge group of persons working on there. 
That was a patient. The electrodes were implanted above the elbow percutaneously that we do not experience those bending forces on the cables of the elbow. Um, they had 16 contacts per implant and was a kind of kinked substrate that seven electrodes looked to the left, seven looked to the right, um, and two counter electrodes were integrated that the current uh, sees uh, its counterpart. They were pulled with a needle and a surgical thread through the nerves. Well, those yellow things here are the nerves, engineering way of um, making them. We had percutaneous wires, since there is nothing like a 16-channel or 56-channel implantable connector. And there were force sensors in an artificial hand. And those force information was transferred via computer um, to stimulate the delivering those pulses over the electrodes and then the patient could imagine um, shape of the object or the compliance. That was the idea. Um, the system was hooked up and the first patient was still a 19 inch rack full of equipment um, and a custom made uh, prosthesis. This is here the prosthesis being driven by surface EMG electrodes, so muscle signals. The patient was blinded that he could not discover by the noise that the prosthesis makes um, if this is hard or soft. And you can imagine this is not for daily use. You don't want to go at a high class restaurant using such a loud prosthesis in there or doing it. And was still 19 inch rack. Um, upcoming system was miniaturized, could be carried in the backpack and our chronic patients were able, one, one was able to drive a car, others were able to do what they like to do, like walking around in the garden, um, things like that. So it worked up to six months and I'd like to share with you now the failures. So when you would have asked me in advance, I would have told you it's the thin film. It's so thin it must fail over six weeks if you stimulate about two, three hours per day. This is how the thin films looked like. Um, we had here the electrode size, 18 microns in diameter. And if you look from the side, this is the, the functional iridium oxide. This is the intermediate layer. This flaky cookie-like structure is the, the uh, interfacial layer. And those of you who like to ask me about that, I can talk about that, but probably not in that context of that talk that would last for another 20 minutes. And that's the polyamide. Before, after six months of implantation. What, what I have learned is that we cannot get rid of all the proteins here. So even after days of trypsination, there is still something on the top that, that does not get off. Um, but we see an intact structure, no delamination, no loss of iridium oxide. Um, you would have your own mind as engineers what could have gone wrong. So this is quite promising. The next step was, well, um, having these thin, flexible sheets of polyimide um, interfaced with a ceramic adapter to solder the cables on, probably that could shear off or rip off there. Yeah, it can. It depends on the surgeon if it does or does not. But what we found out is that this connector is also quite stable, even though we are a little bit afraid that soldering with, with lead tin wire is not the final solution for that. But it worked out well. It's still allowed to, according to international medical device laws. And the cables, 16 strand, helically wound into silicone rubber hose, were also fine. So good. But the electrode failed. Why? It was the human factor. So none of the persons using the electrodes read the user's manual. You know that very well, I think, yeah? Um, and by not reading it, and we completely underestimated that problem, those persons kinked the con cable connector, Stefan. All of you know those nasty, too expensive connectors from Omnetics, but they are the only one having 16 channels at that, si at that size, right? And after four or five months, just by bending, handling them, they broke. And well, the solution is as easy as stupid and simple. You just have to reinforce them and then they don't break. But they cannot be implanted. That means for translational research into a fully implantable system. Um, and I don't, I don't mean that it's not allowed. Well, if it's not allowed and it works, you can come around. But, but it doesn't work for, for a long time. So, so there must be another solution. 
and probably in two or four or six years I would be very happy to deliver one of those solutions but still there's nothing around that really works. That, that was the surprise for us, it's all about cables and connectors there. Um, what about CNS interfaces? So we started to have those for us high number, 250 contact point ECOG arrays for non-human primates. Um, and the question is, how good do they last? Right? They should be implanted into trained monkeys, so that's a lot of effort that you have to do. How long can you record? And that was our first version being published in 2009. Um, it was a nightmare for the PhD student to solder those different type of omnetics connectors uh, for 252 channels to a 10 micron thick substrate. And I was told by our colleagues, Pascal Fries and co-workers from the Max Planck Institute, it was also a nightmare to, to implant that stuff. Um, but it worked well, but we were not happy with the system concept because that is a single sheet and if you fail at the last soldering point, you have another demonstrator uh, for the next whatever, girls day, boys day, day of the open house, but it does not work because you screw up the whole system at the very last second. And as we see, can see, um, this transition here of the percutaneous wires that goes through the skull, this is then mounted with, with a pound of dental cement on, on the skull of the monkey, uh, this is quite, quite wide. Can that miniaturize somehow? And we, we invented, so not we means Eva invented in her PhD thesis, um, a kind of Christmas tree modular approach where you have different lines that you can assemble one after the other on a rigid substrate and thereby you can exchange. If one fails, you just rip it off and, and take the next one. So higher yield and you can miniaturize uh, the width here down to about two millimeter, having again 250 channels of electrode sites. And the question is how far can you go with that? Um, if I ask my, my guys and girls to do something like this, they are not that happy. But if somebody else comes from the outside, they take us as a challenge, right? And so we were asked, can we go further on? And you can imagine soldering is not that much fun. This is here 40, for 448 sites for very specific um, attention task coding. Um, where the, the visual cortex and the premotor cortex and all the stages in between should be somehow covered on the surface of the skull. That works out well and then they came and said, ah, can we go above 1000 and can we have a modular concept? And yeah, you can, but you see it's not really fun with the connectors here. The question, however, is how long does that work? We're not talking about a week or two. And we um, had implantations now um, this is data, this is uh, an example of 17 months in a monkey and in those after 17 months we have a dropout of 20 contacts out of 252, that's less than 8%, I'm quite proud of that. But the question is why did they fail and where did they fail? If you look here on the left hand side on the array you have no idea, you say, ah, hmm. yeah they failed, period. But if you look on the connector side, you see that there could be kind of creeping here from one contact to the other that they short circuit. So there must be something just by handling putting the connectors on and on and you need a certain force and if you wiggle around, probably you destroy a little bit of epoxy or dental cement or whatever and then water leaks in and chemistry does its way. So the question therefore is what can we do to enforce the in insulation resistance and then make it like, like a cushion. You know, if you, if you have a, f a, a flexible damper, probably that's better. Yeah, that took us a while and we read a lot and one of my PhD students um, had to, to realize our stupid ideas that we had. Um, and the idea is, and there's a poster around in the afternoon, um, when we take silicone rubber in cardiac pacemakers, in deep brain stimulators and cochlear implants to insulate the lines. Can we take that material also for microsystems? So that would be having 
the desired 1000 channels. You have the electrode array, you might have an implant package, you have to protect the electronics, but how do you prevent that you have short circuits between adjacent contact pins then on, on, on your circuitry? And the idea here is to take a sheet of silicone rubber, punch holes into that, glue that in a dry manner using oxygen plasma on, on the surface of your package, put the array on the other side, glue it with oxygen plasma, not having any other nasty stuff on top, and just contact the pin of um, the array with the pin of the package. And you know that just is the really mean four letter word in, 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 in science. Um, took us about three years to go, go there. Um, so that is here that sheet and we obtained under accelerated aging to see if, if this is right. This is 22 weeks because I just read his thesis while, while traveling. Um, so we have no long, more long-term data, but having accelerated aging at 60 degrees C, um, we still have an insulation resistance between adjacent pins of two mech ohm at one kilohertz. Um, if you're on the corporate level, you know um, that the Ball Seal company sells your multi-channel connectors that have 250 kilo ohms, and that's the standard. So we're factor eight above, and we're smaller and, and can integrate that. Um, there's a poster around since my student um, was not able to come because he had to finish his PhD thesis writing because he gets thrown out to since his visa runs out in September and gets a little bit nervous, uh, he decided that I'm experienced enough to present that poster. So if you have questions, you could ask me later on. Um, what about optogenetics? Can we transfer things like that? And we tried to make our mind, what is the challenge from the engineering side in optogenetics? And came out, um, <clears throat> if, if you want to share that, I'm happy about that. That's the advertisement section here. It's, has been recently uh, published in, in current opinions in neurobiology. Um, so if, if we look on optogenetic probes, we, we have on one hand, I've, I, I love that picture with your newborn mouse and having that laser sword implanted um, there for optogenetic ex experiments. It's, it's really the challenge how to get the light in. What about the cables and connectors? Do we have wireless systems? Do we have to hook up everything to external recording devices? And if we do so, what about heating? What about electrical shock? And what about the materials? If they stay longer than a day or a week, what happens to the waveguides, what happens to the laser diodes, what happens to all that stuff that is around. Are the materials that we use for them that are somehow derived from telecommunication or whatever, what, what do they do if they see salt water, right? That's the question, and how to handle that. I learned my lessons in my first project on optogenetics, so we started in 2009, 2010, and published in 2013. Uh, that worked really well. That was a polyimid sample with a microfluidic channel to de deliver the vectors, having here an SU8 waveguide, so all polymer. You could even put it into the MR. Um, when we were ready with all the device, we had all flexible materials, and that thing was stiff as a piece of wood because it was too thick, and then flexible materials turned into stiff ones, right? And that was the probe. And that was the connector. You can imagine that is not really fun to implant that. First, having dental cement around the electrical connections, not gluing up here that, that counter electrode, having the fer ferrule thing for, for the waveguide, having here a microfluidic channel to, to inject the vectors, that was a nightmare. Even though we had good results, we thought oh, probably we should step back, uh, think about that, and look what we can do. And Marie and Linda are currently working on that uh, with the idea, can we have probably for, for surface coupling, if you would imagine to have an ECOG array coupled with some light sources, can we have hermetic packages probably with lenses inside that we can focus the light um, and guide electrical feed-throughs through. And I thought for a short moment probably I could, could 
could show you a stolen picture from, from the, the WIMS Center here at the University of Michigan because you all had those packaging issues already in 2004 on, on schedule and I thought, well, you know your slides better than I do. So I stayed away from that. And the other thing is how to bring, how to make hermetic features, hermetic means water and gas tight with waveguides. In many cases, persons use polymer waveguides and to couple them to a hermetic package is quite challenging. So Marie gives a poster this afternoon and next, ne to, tomorrow afternoon on that. But another question was, what about waveguides? Well, are they stable? If you put the transparent waveguide into salt water and it turns opaque, it's no longer a waveguide, right? It's a nice feature, but it does not help. Um, and we, we started with, with silicone rubber because that's very flexible, it's quite transparent, and we thought we could integrate some, some waveguides, and it worked out well. So having a good silicone rubber, um, you have still more than 95% of transmission after nearly, well, two, 263 days at 60 degrees C. I can promise you, if you take the wrong uh, PDMS, you go down to 50-60% of transparency. Um, we also found out, and that's something I skipped here, um, was that the, the standard glasses degrade like crazy, so you have to cover them. If they see uh, chlorine and sodium, um, they just go away within two, three weeks. That's fine if you have acute experiments, right, or subchronic ones. If you want to do something over years, you have to take care. And with that, um, I like to come to an end and, and discuss a little bit. I think we have to keep in mind that we should go on with iterations, not waiting for the very final device or the very final result, but really see how far we are, what can we gather as knowledge, and then couple out whatever is available for, for certain sub-applications and not look for the ideal one size for all. Um, if it goes from fundamental neuroscience into, let's say, chronic experiments, translational research on humans, um, it's very important not only to have the technological background about the pathophysiological uh, processes, but also be on the right technology readiness level. Um, that means proving the concepts at a very early stage and then try to make it robust and reliable and not forget that the prototype and the proof of concept is a very early phase and that you will burn at least twice as much as money to come to a product um, that is needed um, as you need to come to the proof of concept stuff. Um, and that the valley of death broke a lot of necks in translational research in, in many groups. So to conclude and be at the end of that, um, I think we really, as engineers, have to step back sometimes and have to admit that the application has to determine um, the manufacturing technology and not the other way around. So if I just have a hammer, not everything is a nail. Um, we need robust and reliable systems to be able to go into chronic settings. Um, I think we still could train um, our common language in neural engineering from both sides. And I think those meetings are really good for something like that. Um, and as already said, it's a long way um, towards a medical device and a product. But if you don't start and do, don't do the first step, you will never reach the end and no, no new devices on the market. So that's really encouraging. So, so research is cool and we can go ahead. And with that, I'm, I'm at the very end. Just want to thank all the members of my group um, for doing all the beautiful work and have to thank all the funding agencies that donated a lot of money over the last 14 years to make this story to come true. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions.